Here we are in the last clip video for Unit 1. Um, we're wrapping up this rather lengthy study of what it means to think like a geographer. But this will equip us with the tools ready to dive into some very content-specific study in uh, Population and Migration Unit. So now we're going to wrap up with the last lens of geography that we have not yet discussed, which is human-environment interactions. And now much of this we've alluded to, but I want to give you some specific terminology that will empower you to more effectively describe the ways that humans interact with their environment. So first of all, the definition of human, human environment interactions is not particularly revolutionary. It's just the relationship between cultures and the environment. In other words, how do different groups of people interact with the environment? How do they modify the environment? How do they adapt to the environment? And those two key term, those two terms are important. Modify means, of course, to change, and adapt to would mean in this context that the that the humans themselves are changing something about their behavior as a response to the natural environment around them. Just peeking at these pictures here, the, the picture top right are known as cenotes down in Mexico. You see people exploring them. We see bottom left that the environment and influences the uh, agricultural practices of people and how they feed themselves. Bottom right, that's an example of uh, a Shinto shrine, Shinto in being a Japanese uh, ethnic faith which is also highly influenced by the natural environment. So many, many different ways in which the humans, the human beings interact with the environment and vice versa. A term that we already learned, but I want to put it into some um, different context this time around. The cultural landscape, um, this term of course means that all human-induced changes that evolve, that involve, excuse me, the surface and the biosphere. Surface of the earth, of course, being what we live on, the biosphere, the area um, that surrounds the earth, or surrounds the, the surface of the earth. So the cultural landscape, when we, f we focus on the cultural landscape, I want you to picture looking out your window and looking at the area around you. The natural world would be the reference to what naturally exists, nothing crazy. The, the cultural landscape, however, is concerned with any man-made, any human change that is present on the landscape, the, the particular area that which you're studying. Looking here, we see the natural, we see the mountain range, or the, the mountain there, we see uh, the beach area, that of course being natural, all of these different buildings, these road systems, these boats, just the simple way that the land has been landscaped in that bottom section of the picture. All of those are man-made modifications. All of those are part of the cultural landscape. So I wanted you to consider the, the term culture here being in reference to human action. So this cultural landscape, just like we learned already, is the, one of the tools of the geographers to see the ways in which humans have adapted to the environment and the ways in which the uh, environment has forced, forced adaptations from um, human beings. As I mentioned here, this is uh, we, in the earlier flip videos, I think it was 1.2, the form, 1.1, the forms superimposed on the physical landscape by activities of man, superimposed being put on top of, the forms superimposed, the forms meaning anything, the forms superimposed on the physical landscape by the activities of man, that's our cultural landscape. You can see how just looking at this picture versus this picture, those two different cultural landscapes. Right, See, just simply seeing the way in which humans have uh, modified this environment are clear indications of different groups of people, different resources available, different architectural practices, different um, different living conditions. Right, All of this is present just looking at the way that humans change the environment. There's a study of a specific area of, um, of, of geography, really, that's called cultural ecology. And here, that's, that, that's a term that refers to the multiple interactions and relationships between the culture and the natural environment. In other words, this is almost synonymous with human-environment interactions. We can just consider this to be an area of study, cultural ecology, and human-environment interactions sort of being just a generalized term to refer to these interactions. So let's talk about some examples of these of these um, interactions. What you'd be studying. You don't need to. You do not need to copy this all down. But it looks like I'm cutting off a few words here. So let's get those in order. Um, okay. So what does it mean? Th so for human environment interactions here, one of the things that we look at are uh, when we're looking at the way humans adapt to modify and are influenced by their natural world are fossil fuels. I'm going to read a very long definition, then I'm going to give you the specifics. Fossil fuels are buried, combustible, geologic deposits of organic materials that have formed from decaying plants and animals that have been converted to crude oil, coal, or natural gas by dis exposure to heat, and pressure, the, to heat and the pressure of Earth's crust over millions of years. Whoa. Fossil fuel are, is decaying organic matter so that's going to be plants and animals, that as a result of the exposure to the heat and pressure of Earth's crust, turn into the fuels that we use to create energy, So, or so, some of the fuels that we use to create energy. So, for example, 
um, as I mentioned here, oil for our other than obviously goes into to cars, to machines, coal or natural gas. All of these are different sources of energy. We as human beings, um, a very cynical way to say this would be that we are slaves to these, to this, uh, this natural resource that we are, so much of our world depends upon access to fossil fuels, our, particularly here in the United States, where we depend tremendously on these sources of energy. That, of course, is changing. We now have nuclear energy and other sources, more renewable energy sources. But the fossil fuels is a good way to help us understand the dependency and the interactions between humans and their environment, particularly given that we are doing a superb job of depleting the world of the fossil fuels. So that's a way in which the fossil, fuel, the natural environment is influencing human behavior and how the human behavior is now going to have to adapt to the fact that these fossil fuels, we don't have millions and millions of years to sit around and wait. We have to consider alternative sources of energy. That's an example of this of human environment interactions. There are two general schools of thought, two general ways to approach the way to describe how the humans interact with their environment and how the environment interacts with human beings. One of them is called environmental determinism, and this is a um, more archaic, more um, old-fashioned, I guess you'd say, um, way of thinking, which is the idea that human behavior, both individually and collectively, so both by individuals and groups of individuals, is strongly affected by and even controlled or determined by the natural environment. If, you, if people who subscribe to environmental determinism would believe that humans have to just simply adapt to the environment. Whatever the environment is given to them, humans must just simply adapt and create lifestyles around that. Uh, for example, climate, right? That's unchanging. So that, that's going to that's gonna certainly determine a certain, character, certain characteristics of human life, right? However, this has been largely criticized, right? Many people even went as far as to call this theory racist because this would imply that certain groups of people are just bound to be more successful than others. Certain groups living in one area are bound to be more successful than people living in uh, areas with fewer resources. And if you look around our world, and I'll give you a few examples momentarily, that isn't necessarily always the case. And just because you live in a drought-prone area does not mean that you cannot effectively feed your population. Just because you live in an area where there are uh, often hurricanes doesn't mean that you are bound to be destroyed by a hurricane. So environmental determinism has largely been criticized and, and replaced by a different belief, and that belief is called possibilism. And now it's important you understand, as you guys are familiar now, the AP exam, could, AP curriculum could call this the possibilist approach, the possibilism, right? Those, those variations on the term, they all correspond to the same general school of thought or philosophy, which is that possibilism believes that the natural environment merely serves to limit the ranges, choice, range of choices available to a culture. So it's not determining anything. It's not bounding you to be in a particular way. It's just simply, or um, determining, I should say, in a certain way. It's just simply placing limitations on what it is that a group of people can do in a given place. This makes a fair bit of sense when you consider, um, perhaps if you were trying to start a garden in your backyard and you tried to plant a lemon tree, right? You and I live in Washington, D.C. Citrus fruit is very difficult to grow here. It doesn't the right, isn't the right type of soil or climate for, the, for citrus to truly grow. Possibilism you could consider to be more optimistic in terms of humans' ability to modify their environment. There's the idea here, humans must adapt, environmental determinism. Don't have a choice, you adapt your behavior. Possibilism says that humans can actually modify their environment. And one of the key examples that's often cited for that is known as, uh, the, or as the polders of Nether the Netherlands, which is going to be part of your analysis questions for your homework, to learn what those polders are and how it is that the Netherlands, as an area, a country that's below sea level, so imagine the level of the sea and part of the land being below sea level, very low, right? how they were able to effectively modify their environment. Other examples include the, um, the, a lot of the adaptations made, or the modifications, excuse me, in the, the Florida Keys to the Kissimmee River. Um, that was not done particularly effectively, though, and actually led to some unintended um, negative consequences for the environment. Speaking of, the modifications that you make to the environment can be both positive and negative, right? So it could be positive to benefit human life. It could be well-intentioned. But environmental changes can often have very unintended consequences. The ecosystem could be changed. Um, consider the idea, this is not a modification to the environment, but you can consider it comparable to, uh, a lot of people don't like mosquitoes, right? If you got when mosquitoes just wiped them out entirely. Well, that would immediately affect bats because bats feed off of those Oh, that's not good. Um, bats feed off of those mosquitoes. So similarly, when you change one thing about the environment, say the example of the course of a river, where the river flows, or how much water is going to one area versus another, that can have a significant amount of uh, significant 
um, impacts on the people, both in that physical in that uh, surrounding physical area, that could be both positive and negative. So keep that in mind when we get to the when they're your analysis questions. Here's some other examples. Uh, Qatar, right? And the news sometimes says Qatar, but Qatar was what we'll go with for now. I'm circling this here on, on the map in um, in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Qatar, it is 90. You can see here, I just I did this this summer, so you can see, look at the average temperature. We're talking 108, 109, um, 106 degrees. I mean, incredibly, incredibly hot and very dry area. Well, here we see... First of all, that's the city, right? So let's also keep in mind that people would also, many people associate desert, can't live there, um, nothing to build on. Look at that, right? Look at Doha, right? This is this is the one of the richest cities in, uh, really in the world, and in uh, Qatar. Qatar is one of the wealthiest countries in the world due to their oil preserves, um, their oil reserves, excuse me. But you can see here then that they're clearly human beings. Here's then Dubai, similar area in the, um, in the Middle East, that very dry, they're building a water park, right, in Dubai. Now, this is both can be both good and bad. I mean, clearly an example of a human's ability to modify their physical environment, but also something that we need to be cautious of, and and the implications of where this how this changing climate and these deliberate actions can have uh, consequences, both good and bad, for the people. So important to keep in mind, this says here, why are scientists building an ocean in the middle of a desert? So clearly these are all uh, examples of the possibilist approach to human environment interactions. Ooh, I don't know what that sound is. Okay, here are your analysis questions. I'm going to post that YouTube link um, on Ingrid Pro as well. And that about wraps us up.